good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this regular Sunday. Call your attention to first mistakes that are in the bulletin. The hymn of praise that we open with will be not be the way of the cross leads home, but the one that's in your bulletin, stepping in the light. Stepping in the light. Also, the theme of today's service is the cross. We'll have the kids working on the cross downstairs. The sermon will be a little bit different, cast in the form of a dialogue. Back when I was a student pastor in New Jersey, my pastor who was teaching me often did dialogue sermons with the congregation, just took questions and explained the scripture as they made questions. I'm not quite bold enough to do that, but instead scripted some questions that Christy will help me share with you today so you hear it in multiple voices. Also note the announcements printed in your bulletin, prayer meeting 8 a.m. via Zoom, Good News Club at 3.30 after school here on Wednesday, and then you're all invited to Sharpsburg for Bible study 3.15. Continuing in our study of Revelation. Also, the Des Moines Presbytery will meet via Zoom Saturday at 9 a.m. Are there any additional announcements? Then let us worship God. Our opening song is both printed in the bulletin and is in your hymn book, page number 80. We'll sing just the verses that are printed in your bulletin. It's Hallelujah number one, page 80 in your hymn book.
Hear, O oh God, our confessions and grant forgiveness, we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing together the hymn that is in your insert, Stepping in the Light. We'll sing verses 1, 2, 1, 3, and 4. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior and King, shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. Most of us have 
parts of stone. No, he didn't mean that literally, that inside the muscles that make up our hearts are like stone, but rather when we've decided to do something, we get all stubborn. And we won't change our mind, and we won't change our hearts. That's what we've decided to do. Any of you ever get like that? Maybe? Well, God wants us to be willing to change our hearts to follow God's way. To follow the way of the cross. Now, the cross is a symbol in our church. But Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, thinking not about himself first, but about others. And in the same way, God wants us to change our hearts so that we don't think selfishly, but put God and others first. We have a little song that we're going to sing before we send you down. It's called, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Did you know that your heart had eyes? It, it really doesn't. But it's a symbolic song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. Yes, ma'am. Not really have eyes, but we're supposed to let it be soft and listen for God and look for God. It's kind of a song that's symbolic. But we're going to sing it today. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Congregation, you help us. It's just the chorus of the song. We're going to try. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Try it again. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Good. So, as you go downstairs today for your Sunday school, I've got a bag for you. It's got a treat. And inside, a picture of a big cross and a, two, a little cross along with two little readings. Kenzie will read those out to you. And then I want each of you to color your cross. Or if you stay up here, you can just color your cross up here in church. Your choice. Marilyn Brokaw. 
fell, hurt her knee. We lift her up. I got a text this morning asking that we lift up Martha Howland in special prayers. Apparently she will have some tests tomorrow that will determine whether or not she'll have valve surgery. So we would please lift up Martha Howland in special prayer. Todd. Willie and Susan Eggins are watching today and they would like to thank us for our support. And uh, like a, a good elementary teacher, uh, the post has a little smiley emoji holding a heart. Okay. <laughs> Willie and Susan Eggins are watching online, wanting us to know that they're so thankful for our support. Right back at you, Willie and Susan. We lift them up in prayer. And for Susan especially, we lift her up as she deals with cancer. Julie. Amy Gail Weber from Preston. She's in the hospital. She had some kind of back problem, I think, and got me able to walk. Who is it? Angie Gail Weber. Tiffany Gail's sister. Ah, oh, yes. She had an infection and moved from her spine, I guess, and tried to bring her to rewalk. We lift up Angie in our special prayers. Yes. Yes. Um, I want to lift up my son David is back visiting and he's in a kind of a crossroads of his life and he's uh, waiting to get over he's going to fly to Israel where he has a daughter over there and visit and right now the, he's having a little bit of problems with uh, getting to fly over so I'm, I'm praying that it will open up for him we lift up Rosalie's son David we'll also lift up your mother yes Darlene she's kind of about the same and remind our youth group kids, our older youth group kids, anyone who would like to go after worship out to the care center, we've made reservations so we can eat with the people out there. And then our fun activity is until 4 this afternoon we take a hay ride out to Wilson's Lake, sponsored by the Methodist Church. And it's a joint youth group, so we're going with them. So two opportunities, right after worship and at 4 o'clock for the youth as we lift up Darlene Freeman in prayer. Others? Sandra? Patty Zelmer. Patty Zelmer also dealing with cancer and I've had a chance to visit with her a couple times. We lift them up in prayer, Mark and Patty Zelmer. Any others? Let us pray. God of all comfort and peace. On this anniversary of 9-11, we lift up our world, Lord. We pray, Lord, that the effects of terror might not linger, but that there might be healing and peace. We pray for the people of Afghanistan for those who will live there and those yearning to leave. We pray for refugees everywhere, Lord, that you might open the eyes of our hearts to receive them in. We pray for the specific concerns that have been lifted up today. We pray for Patty Zelmer and Susan Agins, both on hospice care, dealing with cancer. Lord, strengthen them, heal them, we pray. We pray for Angie as she learns to walk again, for David as he prepares to go to Israel, for Darlene as she recovers from a fall and a hurt shoulder. We pray for Martha as she goes for tests, revealing whether she can have surgery, and for Marilyn who is now in urgent care. And we lift up Spencer and all those, Lord, who put their lives on the line in various ways soldiers and firefighters and nurses, and daycare workers and aides. Hear, O oh God, the prayers of your people, even as we pray the prayer you taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our minute for mission today is Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. It's a part of the Presbyterian Church that reaches out to those in need. And this week I thought of Melvin Fender, who has gone on to be with the Lord now. But he started going on mission trips with Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, and then after that, every time a disaster hits somewhere in the world, without saying anything to anyone, Melvin would write a check, put it in the offering plate, saying, for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to reach out. Just want you to know, if ever you want to say, what can I do to help those who have been caught in Hurricane Ida, those caught in the earthquake in Haiti, those stranded in Afghanistan. Presbyterian Church is working in all those places through Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And if ever you'd like to loan monetary support, you can just put it in the offering and earmark it. PDA or Hurricane Relief or anything. And Sandra will sort it out with Samuel and it will be sent on to Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to help. Thank you for your generous support in the past and in the future. Let us receive our morning tithes and offerings. Someone to help Jim? Take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, 
And those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can anyone give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with all his holy angels. Our song of meditation, 170 in your hymn book, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Remain seated as we sing together, 170. Protect 
Jesus to shield him from harm. When they tried to arrest him, it was Peter who pulled out the sword and cut off the ear of the slave of the high priest. And it was Peter who said, I will never let them put you to death. He probably thought of himself as some kind of bodyguard who would always keep safe the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, as to your second question, I'm not sure we ever think of ourselves as holy bodyguards, keeping Jesus safe, but many, many times we confuse our own plans with God's plan. We put our own ways ahead of God's way. And in those times, Jesus might just rebuke us. Call us Satan, for we're acting like Satan who was cast out of heaven for rebelling against God, for thinking his plan was better than God's plan. Now Jesus was chastising Peter, so Peter would get on board with God's plan which we now know meant that Jesus would die on the cross before being raised from death to new life. Well, again, I don't want to be rude, but that brings up another question. According to Mark's Gospel, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to die, but he didn't mention that he would be nailed to a cross by the Romans, granting the request of the Jewish religious leaders. So don't you suppose that Peter and the other disciples were confused when Jesus told them, you must take up a cross and follow me? I, I think you're spot on, Christy. You know, we have the benefit of knowing the whole story before we read it. I mean, we know that Jesus died on the cross and was raised. Peter and the other disciples didn't yet know that he would die on the cross, so Jesus was dropping hints, in fact, told them plain. So how confusing it must have been to them to hear Jesus say, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll save it. That only makes sense in light of Jesus' death and resurrection. In fact, there's so many things that we read in the Bible that only make sense in light of Jesus' death and coming back to life. So if the disciples of Jesus were confused, we need to give them a break. But as for us, we should be able to understand better knowing the whole story before reading a part. We should understand what it means to be willing to die. Well, sure, except that most people have a strong will to live. We've been created by God to live, and even Jesus told his disciples, I have come that you might live and live abundantly. It's not easy to accept that God wants us to give up the lives we are currently living for a life we have never lived. And it's even harder to take up the cross and follow Jesus if that means being willing to offer, to be willing to suffer and die. You're right. You're right. Now, how foolish it is for pastors sometimes to stand up in the pulpit and, and act like giving up your life for Christ is the easiest thing in the world. It's the opposite. It's the hardest thing in the world to do. You have to let go of everything you've ever known and embrace the unknown. It means accepting that you're going to have to suffer. It means being willing to die. And that's absolutely the hardest thing in the world. We dream of living, not dying. So, do you know of anyone who took up their cross and followed Jesus, who actually suffered and died for the sake of Jesus or the sake of the gospel? I'm glad you asked. When I was in college, I read a book that changed my life. It was called The Shadow of the Almighty, a biography of a man named Jim Elliot, written by his widow, Elizabeth Elliot. At age 22, as a senior at Wheaton College, Jim Elliot decided that God was calling him to go to Ecuador to the jungle, to preach the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection 
to the members of the Auka tribe, which had never heard the gospel proclaimed, in part because no missionary had yet been able to figure out their dialect, and because they had told, let it be known, that anyone who crossed into their tribal land would be killed. When Jim Elliott's friends heard that he was planning to go to Ecuador and wanted to go to the Hauka tribe, they said that he was a fool. In response, he wrote this in his diary. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm guessing that his life on earth was the thing he thought he could not keep no matter how hard he tried. Right. And that eternal life with God was the thing that he thought he could not lose as long as he put his faith in Christ. Is that right? Bingo. That's exactly what Jim Elliott was thinking. And he went into the Amazon jungles of Ecuador, spent four years learning languages and preaching the gospel to many different peoples of many different tribes. Many people gave their lives to Jesus had the eyes of their hearts open. But after four years, he decided he was ready to go to the Auka tribe. And with four other missionaries, they made contact with the Aukas. They went and met at a river. And all five were killed. His wife Elizabeth, who was also a missionary in Ecuador, grieved his death. But she also rejoiced that Jim had been willing to take up a cross and follow Jesus even to the point of death. Well, that was a pretty dramatic story, Tim. And so was the story of Sophie Scholl, the young woman that you brought to my attention a couple of days ago. She was an anti-Nazi activist who spread anti-Hitler literature around her university in Germany. She was arrested, charged with treason, and killed. But in letters she left behind, she wrote a lot about her willingness to die for Jesus Christ, in whom she put her trust and for the cause of justice. Let's share a few things she wrote, starting with this. Real damage is done by those who want only to survive, who just want to be left in peace who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything than themselves. Those who live small, die small. Powerful words from Sophie Scholl. Here's something else she wrote. Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues, and a little candle burns out like a flaming torch. I choose my own way to burn. Here's yet another thing that Sophie Scholl wrote. People think of our times as being the last before the end of the world. The evidence of horror all around us makes it possible. But isn't that idea of minor importance? Does every human being have to be accountable to God at any given moment? Yes, we are accountable to God at every given moment, every decision we make. Sophie Scholl was a Christian a devout Catholic who tried to live out her faith, though she wavered a bit at times, which shows us her humanity. She wrote, I know that life is a doorway to eternity, and yet my heart so often gets lost in petty anxieties. Yet I will cling to the rope that God has thrown me in Jesus Christ, even when my numb hands can no longer feel it. Well, it sounds to me like Sophie Scholl was not only willing to put up her cross and follow Jesus, she actually did it. Perhaps I can do the same thing in some small or large way. Perhaps I can follow Jesus in my day-to-day -day life. And by the way, Tim, I think we've taken up all your time to do a lot of greater sermon. Such is life. <laughs> Such is life. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for the witness of Jim Elliott, for the witness of Sophie Scholl, for the witness of so many people who in so many ways do take up their crosses and follow Jesus. Help us to never scorn those who suffer for your sake, but to lift them up in prayer and with our lives. Send us forth 
into the world to speak in a thousand tongues of your love and your grace. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Three verses in your hymn book. Number 74. Stand as we sing together. 74.